You're listening to the expository preaching ministry of Kootenai Community Church, located in Kootenai, Idaho. We pray that Christ is exalted and your spirit is blessed by the teaching of God's Word. For more information about Kootenai Church, please visit us online at kootenaichurch.org. Okay, let's open in prayer. Lord, thank you this morning for your gracious kindness to us every day. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your your son, the blessed Lord Jesus, who has taken our sin upon himself and given us his righteousness. This morning, as we look into your word, we look expectantly, knowing that you will teach, that you will give grace and you will give illumination so that we might honor you and obey you in our lives every day. Lord, as we as we prepare, we think about the folks that are that are struggling and have uh, difficulties and surgeries. We think of Lanny and pray, Lord, that you would guide the doctors, that you would give them wisdom, that they would be able to, to um, appropriately diagnose what is really necessary and, and do the job that they can do to fix his hand by your guidance as, as you would, Lord. We thank you for that. And, Lord, we just pray for the situation over at Lignetics, whatever's going on there, a fire. We pray for safety and for uh, safety for the, the first responders and that uh, there be no damage and that... Uh, that this business would be able to continue to work to keep people employed. Help us in our study of your word again this morning, Lord. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So, the last time I was with you, we were in um, 2 Corinthians. Imagine that. Pardon? We might still be, we might still be yes. And we, were on, we had finished with verse 14. So we're going to read um, chapter 6 from verse 11 to the end of the chapter. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, 11 through the end of the chapter. Our mouth has spoken freely to you, O Corinthians. Our heart is opened wide. You are not restrained by us, but you are restrained in your own affections. Now, in like exchange, I speak as to children. Open wide to us also. Do not be bound together with unbelievers. For what partnership have righteousness and lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? Or what harmony has Christ with Belial? Or what has a believer in common with an unbeliever? Or what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God, just as God said, I will dwell in them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore come out from their midst and be separate, says the Lord, and do not touch what is unclean. And I will welcome you, and I will be a father to you, and you shall, be my, you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. So last time I was with you, I was using an analogy of, um, and I'm trying to remember it, it was kind of a, an off-the-cuff, on-the-spot analogy, and when I don't write stuff down and I have to correct mistakes I made that I didn't write down the mistakes I made, it's more difficult. I was talking about the, the, the idea of... Uh, <clears throat> You know, I, I, it's absolutely lost to me. So, so when I think of how to correct whatever it was that I did wrong, <laughs> what's the test drive, but I can't remember what the context was. Yeah, why don't you? <laughs> yeah. It was how uh, we operated it in our family. My, my sons and my daughters, my son courted my daughter-in-law. And uh, got to know her under the, under the authority of her father. And that's what I would say would be the, the equivalent. Same thing with my daughters, the two boys. Well, they're men. The two men that married my daughters. Uh, we spent time together. We went through, I, I, I went through uh, the quali- qualifications for marriage. Uh, t- I have 28 qualifications for men and 31 for women. Not, I'm not sure, just, just how it worked out. That's just how it worked out, the numbers. And we went over that and studied the concept of marriage and together. And that's what I was talking about. Is that helpful? Okay. I don't want to be accused of... I mean, there's all kinds of strangeness out there today. So, so do not be bound together with unbelievers was the last verse we mentioned, we talked with together, talked about together. Second Corinthians 6, 14. For what partnership have righteousness and lawlessness? Now... Um, interestingly enough, I didn't mention this last time, but there are people who think that this is, this is an evidence that this is a different letter that was patched together. 
I, and I've read some of the, I, just for giggles, I read some of the letters I wrote to legislators and I wrote to my wife. And, and you'll be chugging along talking about one thing and then you change the subject. Isn't that legal? That's what Paul did here. He very simply in this symbol, this single letter, was encouraging the Corinthians to open up to him. And then a subject came up in his mind. And the Holy Spirit directed him to encourage the Corinthians to spend no time uh, yoked together with unbelievers. Uh, and it, it kind of follows on the heels of what he's been talking about. Um, so he instructed the court, his instructions that we talked about to the Corinthians were often sometimes met with disobedience. Later, however, it looks like the believers in Corinth, both realizing the accuracy and the truth of Paul's encouragement, would not only obey, but they took his, they took his um, instructions to some extreme. Remember that he instructed them, he told them he had already judged the young man who was violating the marriage vows by living with his father's wife. He said, I've already judged him. You need to, ex basically said, you need to get him, out of the, get him out from your midst. And so they did that. And they did it with a vengeance, if you will. And they stayed at it even after he had repented. And so Paul had to come back later in 2 Corinthians and encourage them to forgive that man, lest sorrow become compounded with sorrow when he had done the right thing, the biblical thing, and he, would not, he was not being received back into fellowship. So the Corinthians would take his instructions and then finally run with them and run hard with them. And so Paul is here giving them some more balance. What partnership, he says, has righteousness with lawlessness? What fellowship has light with darkness? And so then we, we looked at false teachers and the, the partnership that we have with God uh, in, in developing, or excuse me, in spreading the gospel. So we talked about if you were in a trade, that uh, if it, what can be said of your fellow tradesmen, having light with darkness together, can probably be said of you, that's a good thing if it's good things. If what can be said of your fellow tradesmen can be said of you, and it is good things, that's a good thing. But if you are an electrician, and, and I would just use electrician because it came to my mind, and it is known that the other electricians in your group are dishonest. You would not want to be associated with that. That was the idea Paul was giving here. So then, moving into verse 15, he says, Or what harmony has Christ with Belial? Or what has a believer in common with an unbeliever? How many of you like barbershop quartets? What is it about them that you like? The harmony. That's where we get, that's what this word actually is, the Greek word from which we get the word symphony. Um, and it uh, is something, when you're, when you're working together with someone, let me get to my, where I belong here. When you're working with someone, especially and most importantly in ministry, you want what you're saying to be true to Scripture. And you want what they're saying to be equally true to Scripture. Because if it's not... You're mixing light with darkness again. You're mixing unrighteousness with righteousness again. So Paul says here, what harmony has Christ with Belial? Or what is a believer in common with an unbeliever? To be in harmony is to be saying the same thing. Essentially the same thing. When the quartet is singing, they are singing on different keys or at different stages. But aren't they saying the same words? Now, uh, granted, there are songs where there's rounds and, and people are saying different things, but that's actually uh, a progression that, that makes the song more effective. But in this particular case, when we're talking about harmony, you're singing the same thing. <laughs> this word again is <clears throat> where we get our word for symphony. If you cannot acknowledge the same doctrines of grace that define who God is, what His character is, the Trinity, the deity of Christ, the virgin birth, and several other essential um, base, baseline doctrinal truths of Christianity with someone you are working with in ministry, if you cannot acknowledge those together, you are unequally yoked. And you cannot work with them. No matter what they say about themselves. The place you check these is Scripture. You check this with Scripture. Is what they're saying in harmony with Scripture. If it is not, you cannot work with them. For many reasons. For one, you'll be sowing discord. What you'll be saying will be different from what they're saying. 
that's a that's a that's a, a negativity to begin with, and not only that, but their negative uh, view of the scriptures will be associated with you, as well. <clears throat> you are not saying the same thing. There is no symphony there. There is discord, argument, and falsehood. Belial is another name for Satan. What believer would want to be intimately linked with Satan in any work at all? Hopefully none. Then Paul says, what has a believer in common with an unbeliever? Here the word for believer is the standard word for faith. One who has faith. The word for unbeliever is actually one without faith. It's a juxtaposition in the Greek. Pistos and apistos. Two, two variations of the very same word. One with faith cannot be in harm, cannot be working with one without faith in the ministry. I'm not saying you can't dig a ditch, you can't wire a house. What I'm saying is you can't promulgate the gospel. You can't teach, you can't minister with someone like this because they will undermine everything you do. Very simple. Paul is saying that there is no common ground in this area between faithful believers and unfaithful infidels. There was no such thing in early Christianity and in Christianity indeed, but for sure, in the first century and, and for many centuries later, there was no such thing as propositional or speculative faith. You were either a believer or you were an unbeliever. You are either pregnant or you're not. You are either dead or you're alive. You know, there are certain things that there is either A or B. There is no middle ground. You can't be an almost believer. It's like several other things that you can't be almost, and we'll just leave those alone. Once the Father regenerated you so that you now have the faith to believe, you believed. Christ didn't come to maybe save sinners. He came to save sinners. And those who are the elect are soundly saved when they're regenerated, not propositionally or speculative, speculatively saved. There's no such thing as an almost believer. No such thing. It doesn't exist. Any questions or comments about that verse? What harmony has Christ with Belial? Or what has a believer in common with an unbeliever? Then he says in verse 16, Or what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God, just as God said, I will dwell in them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Verse 16. There can be no intermingling at all between Christianity, biblical Christianity, and idolatry. Idolatry can be described as anything at all that is worshipped other than the true God, whether it is a totem or the dollar, anything at all that is worshipped other than the true God. It can be as obvious as a people group worshipping a totem or as insidiously deceitful as a twist of doctrine that obscures the truth about the Trinity. That is idolatry. If you're not worshipping the true Trinity, you're worshipping an idol. The virgin birth, the salvation, it, salvation itself, or any other bedrock principle of Christianity, that all of those can be compo components of an idolatrous lifestyle. If you're falsely using them, falsely believing, believing false um, untruths about them. We'll get this yet. The word translated agreement is a Greek word which means to put down together in agreement. It doesn't matter what the agreement is. If it's false doctrine and an attempt is made in any way, shape, or form to incorporate it into Christianity, it is evil. We need to use the correct terms. Incorporating idolatry into biblical Christianity is evil. It's not a mistake. It's not a bad idea. It's evil, and it will destroy. It's this, in the same way God judged Manasseh in 2 Kings chapter 21 for building altars to the host of heaven in the courts of the house of the Lord, so he will judge any admixture of the true with the false. And Paul's allusion to the temple of the living God is very appropriate. Every believer individually is a temple in which God the Holy Spirit, and I, I, don't, I didn't know of another way to say it, so I'm going to say it this way. Every believer is individually a temple in which God the Holy Spirit is housed, if you will. To join that temple with untruth is a terrible injustice. Paul quotes Leviticus 26, 12. I will also walk among you and be your God, and you shall be my people. 
to great effect here. Being yoked with unbelievers in such a way has always been considered blasphemous. The father means to be intimately involved with his children, and so they must be separate from the wickedness of the world and the wickedness of what is parading as Christianity, but is not. Whether it is purpose-driven or Catholicism, it is not. It is false. And to associate with it is a blight on the gospel and a damage as much as we can damage the image of the, of the wonderful God of this world. So any questions about verse 16 or comments? And all of this is kind of linked together, 16, 17, and 18. Therefore, in verse, yes. So, you, what happens is we, we think that if we have numbers, we're going to be more effective. And so we look for people that we can engage with first without checking into what they believe first. And so if, if, if Kootenai Community Church engages with a church that has less than stellar, solid doctrine, we will be saying different things. So first of all, the effect is lost. Secondly, the testimony of the church is damaged. Thirdly, it will confuse believers in both churches to great damage. Now, if it confuses believers in the one that is less than solid doctrine to come into the light, that's not a reason to do it, by the way. But that would be a, a good fallout, if you will. It's a bad, it's a bad idea to associate. You, you need to be very careful that if you're going to associate with min in ministry with other churches, that they be doctrinally sound. Doctrinally sound. That's why God created the, the, the local body. That's why God allows the local body. I think, I think he wants to use the gifts in this body to move the gospel forward, whether it be in the realm of politics or whatever. But in here, on Sunday mornings, and for our teaching, we don't teach about politics. We, we, we preach the gospel. Because everything is transformed by the gospel. Everything. And uh, was that a, a satisfactory answer or did I politically beat around the bush? And it seems to some degree to the world today to be heartless and unkind. That's because they're not interested in truth. Truth divides. Truth unites. But it also divides. And, and, and my temptation is to use a very unkind statement and say, get over it. But I don't want, I'm not going to say that. Truth, the true truth, the truth of Scripture will divide families. And we need to be willing to have that division occur. Let it be the truth that divides, though, and not our attitude and our snarkiness and our own lack of resistance to the evil in our own lives, the sin in our own lives. Let it be the truth of Scripture that purifies a movement, if you will. Uh, and that's why it's not a great... I, I know this is going to sound kind of interesting from a guy who's been in politics a lot, but for churches to get too intimately involved often with other churches because there's so much that needs to be vetted at first, needs to be carefully thought through that's what we've done here. That's why we're all here. We believe this. We really believe this. And everything that it intimates and everything that it purposefully changes in our lives, we really believe this. We've decided that together. And that's why the beauty of the unity of an actual body of Christ is incredible, where people take care of one another. They've, they've sorted the doctrine issue out. Now, it comes up now and then throughout the, bo the body, throughout the life of a vibrant Healthy body of Christ, local body of Christ. These things will come up from now and then. Somebody will say something from the pulpit and two or three people in the body will go, I ain't never heard that before. I wonder what that means. Where do they go though? What is so exciting to us, to us elders is when, to we elders, to the four of us, is you go to the scripture. You don't go to us. That's where we want you to go. Go to the word of God. At any rate, we could beat this to a, to a, to a pulp, but just be careful. The unity that God wants must be built around Christ himself and the doctrine of the scriptures. 
So therefore, <laughs> come out from their midst. <laughs> Let's see, did I, did I? I didn't finish verse 16. So I will walk among you and be your God. I will also walk among you and be your God. I said, Paul uses it to great effect. Being yoked with unbelievers in such a way has always been considered blasphemous. The father means to be intimately involved with his children, so they must be separate from the wickedness of the world. That is a given. Any questions or comments about verse 16? Nathel. Okay. So building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith. Paul, yeah, Paul puts that in particular order. The Holy Spirit put that in particular order. We're united around, as Jim said, we're united around Christ. We're not united around a cause. Or the causes can be useful and purposeful and, and effective in changing the, the church, changing the world. But the unity has to come around Christ himself. Yes. If you're uniting around a person, you're uniting for the wrong reasons. Paul fought that in 1 Corinthians. I'm of Apollos. I'm of Peter. I'm of Paul. No. Wrong. Gong. We need to be of Christ. Amen. Therefore, <laughs> so then Paul, or what harmony has, or what agreement has, Based on that, Corinthians, therefore, come out from their midst and be separate, says the Lord, and do not touch what is unclean, and I will welcome you. He here quotes Isaiah chapter 52. In uh, chapter 52, verses 11 and 12, uh, Isaiah said, Depart, depart, go out from there, touch nothing unclean, go out of the midst of her, purify yourselves, ye who carry the vessels of the Lord. But you will not go out in haste, nor will you go out as fugitives, for the Lord will go before you, and the God of Israel will be your rear guard. In Isaiah, God is calling, was calling Israel to be separate from the idolatry of Babylon. Paul here in Corinth applies it to the Corinthians, calling them to separate themselves from even, I hesitate to call it this, but what would have been called the soft idolatry of their day. Idolatry is idolatry, but it wasn't, it wasn't they were going to, unfortunately, they were some of the stronger Christians, it seems like, at least strong in, their, in the doctrine of understanding what demons were, they were going to temples and partaking of the food there to the dismay and the damage of weaker Christians. So Paul is calling them out to be separate. He applies it to the Corinthians, calling, themselves to be, calling them to be separate from the, even the soft idolatry they found themselves involved in. Remove themselves from all of it, he is counseling them, and they must pay attention. There shall be no concord with the children of light, and the sons of disobedience. The church is not called to make, and, and from that, hear this, the church is not called to make unbelievers feel comfortable, but to preach the gospel, making all who are not saved terribly uncomfortable with their sin, and all who are saved uncomfortable with their disobedience. The gospel is a purifier. It is a, a flame that will burn away the dross at salvation, and it will continue to burn it away as we, sank, as we are sanctified day by day, working out our salvation in fear and trembling. Unbelievers must face the fact that God will judge all who are not found to be in Christ. You can't sugarcoat it. If you sugarcoat it, you're damning those folks to be on the wide road. We're not to make it easy. The gospel doesn't make it easy. Everybody says, well, the gospel's simple. It's easy. It's, it's simple. It's, it's not complicated, but it isn't easy. He wants your whole life. He wants all of you. No worship of anything else. God wants all your worship. Everyone who has trusted Christ has had to remove themselves to one degree or another from the uncleanness, uncleanness that they participated in before salvation. There should be a distinction it is clear to the world, that is clear to the world between the lost and believers. And not only are believers to come out from what is unclean and separate themselves, they are not to touch it. This comports well with what Paul told the Thessalonians when he said in 1 Thessalonians 5.22, abstain from every form of evil. And the funny thing is, is we know what it is. The Holy Spirit animates our conscience using the Word of God. We know what forms of evil we choose to be involved in. Upon salvation, believers begin the process of sanctification, and it is here prior to sanctification because of the work of Christ. God the Father welcomes believers into an intimate relationship with Him. 
Disobedience, as a believer, will cut off that intimacy. You will not lose your salvation, but you will lose the fellowship that you had. <laughs> it will make a stark difference in your walk with God. <clears throat> Paul is telling the Corinthians, do these things, and God will welcome you. So, they're not to have harmony with Satan. They're not to have to be in common doing the things that, that the gospel requires of them with unbelievers. They're not to have, they're not to worship idols, even in the smallest way, and they are to come out and be separate. That's hard. And, and it's, it's often not done in an attitude of humility. It's, it's often done in an attitude of holier than thou. And God is not calling us to be holier than thou, because we're not. He's calling us to come out. And he will see to the rest of it. He will see to the details. But he's calling us to come out and be separate from those who are not preaching the word of God, who are not occupied, if you will, with Christ. Any questions or comments about verse 17? Every one of us will have a different application of this verse, what it is that we need to come out from. Every one of us. And God will, God will be faithful to lead you in that direction. And then he says in verse 18, And I will be a father to you, and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. So who, is, who are the children of God? The real children of God? Is it everybody? It's these people right here. The ones that he has called out from the midst of the world. Oh, you holier than thou comes to mind. No. Why did he choose me? I have no idea. But I am so grateful. Was it because of something he saw in me? No. That's what was, was headed me the other way. On fast track. It was because of his mercy and his grace alone. And the minute we think it's something other than that, we compromise the gospel. If we do these things, if the Corinthians will do these things, Paul says, he will be a father to them and they will be sons and daughters. It's likely that Paul was harking back to God's promise of a relationship with Solomon, the son of David, in this verse. He said in 2 Samuel uh, 7, 14, I will be a father to him when he was talking to David and he will be a son to me when he, and when he commits iniquity, I will correct him with the rod of men and the strokes of the sons of men. So this would be the result of salvation and especially of obedience subsequent to that salvation. God himself says that he will initiate, implement, and sustain the relationship of a father to sons and daughters. He will implement the, that relationship at salvation. He will sustain it throughout your life. But in that sus sustenance, he will implement the necessary tools and, res and responses to us to discipline us and bring us to holiness, to a holy life. Paul uses the title Kyrios Pantocrator, which means Lord Omnipotent. It's like he was using the word that the Caesars like to apply to themselves, but it wasn't true. Lord Omnipotent, Lord All-Ruling, the God of the universe, if you will. This is who it is that he's talking about. This is the Father, the one who will be a father to the, to the children that come out. It says the Lord Almighty. This is who it is. In other words, you can take this to the bank. Corinthians, come out from them and I will be a father to you and you will be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord omnipotent. Once saved, the believer is now owned, safely owned by the omnipotent, all-ruling, powerful sovereign of the universe and even indeed beyond the universe. We don't want to limit God. The universe is pretty small to him. It's only 30, 35 or so billion light years across, you know, which is farther than from here to Sagal. But to, to God, it's nothing. It's nothing. <laughs> nothing can harm this relationship. It will be a relationship of a father to children, loving, sustaining, discipling, which includes discipline, which includes discipline, and, and it is permanent. It is a permanent relationship. Get that. I cannot begin to say it better than Paul did under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit at the end of Romans chapter 8. The end of Romans chapter 8, verses 31 to 39, he said this, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us, for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? 
Who will bring a charge against God's elect? Satan tried. Flipped him away with his middle finger, with his index finger. Just boom, gone. To Job. He tried to Job. And he tries to believers throughout the eternities, throughout the years. Who is the one who condemns? Jesus Christ is he who died. Yes, rather, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. Who will, who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Just as it is written, for your sake we are being put to death all day long. We were considered as sheep to be slaughtered. But in all these things we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will ever be able to separate us from the love, I, I added a word, excuse me, will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Paul says it better than anybody by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Once the Father makes you one of his children, he is going to do everything that is necessary which for God is, is absolutely simple, to keep you and to make you more like his son. And that is a lifelong endeavor. Um, it would be great for us to be able to step into eternity with very little change occurring in that interface. Some of us are going to enter eternity, as it says in Jude, with the smell of fire on our clothes. And some of us won't, but... Uh, who knows who those people will be? The point is, the gospel is what makes people children of God. The gospel is what makes people children of God. Before that, they're children of disobedience, sons of Belial, and what concord has Belial with righteousness with the believers. So, Paul starts this chapter encouraging the Corinthian not, not to miss God's grace. That is not to benefit from the incredible blessings that come to a child of God. He defends his own ministry, reminding the Corinthians that he had done nothing that would bring disrespect or discredit to the church. He had endured an incredibly difficult life in order to bring the gospel to as many as he possibly could, but he reveled in that life. He delighted in the life that God had brought him. He delighted that God would choose him. He, he, and I believe all through his entire life, he never lost the marvel of what an incredible thing that was, that the chief of sinners would be chosen to be one of the elect by the sovereign God of the universe and to bring that message to the, to the world. He begged the Corinthians to open their hearts to him as wide as he had opened his heart to them. And he ended this section with a warning that they should not be bound together with, idolatry, with the idolatrous civilization that they lived in. Although he dropped this, this warning passage in an, other, in an otherwise heartfelt bearing of his soul to the church that he loved so much, he then finishes with a beautiful reminder of the incredible life that awaits one who, is, who has trusted the Lord Jesus Christ. So this whole chapter is is a testimony to how the Holy Spirit worked in Paul's life to bring, to bring uh, encouragement, mix in a little warning, and finish up with some more encouragement that he would be their father. He would be the father to the children that, that trust him through the gospel. And so I, I don't want to jump into chapter 7 yet. So is there any comments or questions about any of this? Verse 16, verse... Pat. Yes, yes, and, and I'm going to whine about that next week. Yeah, I, I choose very carefully how and when I whine. Yeah. <laughs> Any other comments or questions about chapter 7 or chapter 6? <laughs> I'm already ahead of myself again. Are we out of 1 Corinthians? Nathel. Amen. Such a comfort. By his choice, by his continued saving and maintenance. And so it, it's Peter, I, I should have looked this up, but Peter reminds people that we're to be ready with an answer to whoever comes with us to share to them, what share with them what God has done for us in fear and trembling, carefully, thoughtfully, not, well, he really got a bargain when he got me. No, but often we come across that way, especially to those closest to us. Sometimes we come across that way. Um, all of this will be, should be playing in the, as you, if you will, 
by the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives, playing in our minds as we, as we spread the gospel. It is a free gift. It is a wonderful gift. But it is the only gift that will save you. Good works won't do it. Oh, but we all know that here. But a lot of folks don't. There are so many who stu- still think that if the scale tips in their favor, they're in. No. No, there are no good works until one becomes a child of God. Everything is a filthy rag. And even the works that we do by God's grace that are deemed worthy of reward are by His power in our lives. We don't even have the the ability to do those alone. And that's a good thing. So, next week, or I don't know if, are you teaching next week, Jess? Next week we'll be back in Philippians. And then after that, if you want to read chapter 7, and I got that right, not chapter 6, not chapter 8, read chapter 7. And we'll look at uh, a uh, a joyful recitation of the blessings that the church at Corinth had brought him. Paul now will turn a little bit and, actually I should say return a little bit to the bearing of his soul and the encouragement, the encouraging work that uh, that uh, the Corinthian church had done for him. This is the church that against all odds had screwed up as much as they possibly could. But he loved them. He cared for them. They were a blessing to him, time without end, times without end. And he'll talk about that in chapter 7. Let's close in prayer. Father, thank you that your word is so rich and varied. Uh, you, could have, you could have used just the book of John. You are the mighty God, the all omnipotent sovereign of the universe. You could have used just one book, John or Matthew or whatever, to bring all that was necessary. But you chose to give us a fleshed out picture that uh, transforms our lives by the work of the Holy Spirit. And that is something that we need to be able to lovingly and humbly spread to the world. The gospel is what the world needs. They don't need another project. They don't need another direction. They don't need another unification. They need the gospel. They need the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let us be those who bear it to them in in joy and in fear and trembling. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for listening to the latest podcast from Kootenai Church. If you'd like to learn more about Kootenai Church or to donate to our church ministry, you can do so online by visiting KootenyChurch.org. We hope you enjoyed this podcast and pray you'll join us again next time. Once again, thank you for listening.